Chapter Sixteen of Tilda Jane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dini Stain, Kelowna, Canada. Tilda Jane by Marshall Saunders. Chapter Sixteen The Tiger in His Lair. The next house to that of the French people was larger and more pretentious than theirs. It had more of a garden, there were two stories instead of one, and the roof was surmounted by a tiny tower. The outside of the tiger's den was highly satisfactory, and Tilda Jane smiled in weary stoical humor. Now to find the particular corner in which the tiger himself abode. The house was dark except for one feeble glimmer of light on the ground floor. She had rapped at the front door. She had rapped at the back door without getting any response. And now she returned for the latter to see if perchance it had been left unfastened. It had, and lifting the latch cautiously, she went in. She knew Mr. Dilson was an old man. She knew he was lame, and possibly he heard her but could not come to her rescue. Passing through a small porch where she stumbled against some heaped-up pans, she turned the first doorknob she touched in passing her hand along the dark wall. She found herself in a kitchen. The table in the middle of the floor, the chairs, the dresser, were all illuminated by a feeble, dying glow in a small cooking stove, and by the beams of a candle struggling through an open door. Poacher and Gippy crept after her as she proceeded slowly in the direction of this light. They felt that there was something mysterious afoot. Tilda Jane paused at the bedroom door. Here was the lair of the tiger, and there was the tiger himself, an old man with white hair, red eyes, and a nightcap. A candle was on a shelf by the head of the bed, and a pair of crutches was within reaching distance and the old man was lifting his head from the pillow in astonishment. Tilda Jane could not help laughing aloud in her relief. This was not a very dangerous-looking person. He seemed more amazed than vexed, and she laughed again as she noted his clutch of the bedclothes and the queer poise of his white head. "'Excuse me, sir,' she said humbly, "'for coming this time of night, but I thought you'd like me to report first thing.' I hope you've heard from your son I was coming. The old man said nothing. He was still open-mouthed and dumb, but something in his face assured Tilda Jane that he had heard. He had received some news of her apart from the telegram sent by Mr. Jack. I've had lots of experiences, she said with a tired gesture. I'll tell him some other time. I just wanted to announce my rival and tell you I'm going to wait on you good. I guess I'll go to bed, if you'll tell me where to get a candle, and where I am to sleep. He would tell her nothing. He simply lay and glared at her, and by no means disposed to seek a quarrel with him, she made her way back to the kitchen, opened the stove door, and, lighting a piece of paper, searched the room until she found the closet where the candles were kept. The old man lay motionless in his bed. He heard her searching heard the dogs pattering after her, and a violent perspiration broke out upon him. Wrath sometimes gave him unwonted fluency of speech. Tonight it rendered him speechless. He did not wish this beggar's brat to wait on him. Hank had not asked his permission to send her, had simply announced that she was coming. He was treated as if he were a baby, an idiot, and this was his own house. Hank had nothing to do with it. He didn't care if Hank did pay her. He had money enough of his own to hire a housekeeper. But he didn't want one. He wanted to wait on himself. He hated to have women cluttering around. And he lay and perspired and inwardly raged and obtained not one wink of sleep. While Tilda Jane, having obtained what she wished, peacefully composed herself to rest. First, though, she calmly bade him good night, told him to holler if he wanted anything, and calling her dogs, went off in search of a bed for herself. Beyond the kitchen was a front hall, cold, 
dusty and comfortless upstairs were four rooms two unfurnished one having the appearance of a spare room left long unoccupied the other smelling of tobacco exceedingly untidy littered with old clothes fishing rods bats cartridges shells and other boyish and manly belongings this must be hank's room probably it had been occupied later than the other and the bed would not be so damp she would sleep here and she turned down the clothes good land she murmured i wonder how long since those blankets have been washed and she turned them back again and going to the other room obtained two coverlets that she spread over herself after she lay down on the outside of the bed the dogs had already curled themselves up on a heap of clothes on the floor and in a few minutes the three worn-out travellers were fast asleep when tilda jane lifted her head from her very shady pillow the next morning her ears were saluted by the gentle patter of rain the atmosphere was milder a thaw had set in she sprang up and went to the dogs who were still snoring in their corner wake up she said touching them with her foot gippy started but something in the expression of poacher's eloquent eyes told her that although he had been apparently sound asleep he knew perfectly well what was going on about him let's go and see mr dilson she exclaimed and picking up gippy she ran downstairs with poacher at her heels it ain't cold it's just pleasant she muttered turning the key with difficulty in the front door and throwing it open oh how pretty she clasped her hands in delight across the road was the deep hollow of the river she was in one of a line of cottages following its bank and across the river were fields and hills now a soft hazy picture in the rain but the sun would shine fine days would come what an ideal place for a home and her heart swelled with thankfulness and she forgot the cross old man in the room behind her the cross old man would have given the world to have turned her out of his house at that very minute but his night of sleeplessness and raging temper had given him a fierce headache a bad taste in his mouth and such a helplessness of limbs that he could not turn in bed tilda jane fortunately did not know that if he could have commanded his tongue he would have ordered her into the street but she saw that there was something wrong with him and as she stood in his doorway she said pityingly i guess you're sick i'll make you some breakfast and she vanished in the direction of the woodshed he heard her chopping sticks he heard the brisk snapping of the fire and the singing of the tea kettle he heard her breaking eggs two eggs when he never cooked more than one at a time he opened his mouth to protest but only gave utterance to a roar that brought poacher who happened to be the only one in the kitchen into his room to stare gravely and curiously at him she made an omelette she toasted bread she steeped him a cup of tea this slip of a girl she had evidently been taught to cook but he hated her none the less as she brought in a tray and set it beside his bed he would not touch the food and he gave her a look from his angry eyes that sent her speedily from the room and made her close the door behind her i guess he'd like to give me a crack with them crutches she reflected soberly i'd better keep her out of his way till he's over it reminds me of the matron's little spells if she had been a petted darling from some loving home she would have fled from the cottage in dismay as it was although she suffered it was not with the keenness of despair all her life she had been on the defensive some one had always found fault with her some one was always ready to punish her unstinted kindness would have melted her but the anger always increased her natural obstinacy she had been sent here to take care of this old man and she was going to do it she was too unconventional and too ignorant to reflect that her protective attitude would have been better changed for a suppliant one in entering the old man's domain however if she had meekly begged the privilege of taking care of him he would have sent her away 
and as she was given neither to hair-splitting nor introspection but rather to the practical concerns of life she calmly proceeded with her task of tidying the house without reference to future possibilities the kitchen was the first place to be attacked and she carefully examined the stove it smoked a little it needed cleaning and girding on some old apron she found in the porch she let the fire out and then brushed and rubbed and poked at the stove until it was almost as clean outside as it was inside her next proceeding was to take everything off the walls and wipe them down with the cloth bedraped broom then she moved all the dishes off the dresser washed the chairs and scrubbed the floor then and not until then did she reopen the door into the old man's room now he could see what a clean kitchen she had and how merrily the fire was burning in the stove it was also twelve o'clock and she must look about for something more to eat mr dillson had not touched his breakfast so she ate it herself made him fresh toast a cup of tea and a tiny meat hash then went upstairs to tidy her bedroom the hash was well seasoned and the odor of onions greeted the old man's nostrils tantalizingly he was really hungry now his wrath had burned down for the lack of fuel and some power had come back to his limbs he ate his dinner got out of bed dressed himself and limped out to the kitchen when he had dropped in his big rocking chair he gazed around the room the girl had done more in one morning than all the women he had ever employed had done in three perhaps it would be economy to keep her he was certainly growing more feeble and a tear of self-pity stood in his eye there she was now coming from the french woman's house she had been over there to borrow sheets and a flash of impotent rage swept over him he tried to have no dealings with those foreigners he hated them and they hated him this girl must go he could not stand her the back of his rocking chair was padded and before he realized what was happening his state of fuming passed into one of sleepiness he was off soundly and unmistakingly announcing in plain terms through throat and nose to the world of the kitchen that he was making up for lost time last night when he opened his eyes it was late afternoon and tilda jane sitting at a safe distance from him was knitting an unfinished sock of his left by his dead wife some ten years ago he blinked at her in non-committal silence she gave him one shrewd glance with her toe pushed gippie's recumbent body nearer her own chair and went on with her work if he wanted to hear her talk he could ask questions the afternoon wore away and evening came when it grew quite dark tilda jane got up lighted a lamp put on the tea kettle and with the slender materials at hand prepared a meal that she set before the uncommunicative old man he ate it rolling his eyes around the clean kitchen meanwhile but not saying a word tilda jane kept at a safe distance from him until he had finished and had limped into bed she then approached the table and ate a few morsels herself muttering as she did so i ain't hungry but i must eat enough to help me square up that poor old crossy she was however too tired to enjoy her supper and soon leaving it she washed her dishes and went upstairs end of chapter sixteen chapter seventeen of tilda jane this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dini Stain, Kelowna, Canada. Tilda Jane by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 17. The Tiger Makes a Spring. The situation would have been absurd if it had not been painful. The next morning, the old man was still in the same mood angry at the girl's invasion of his premises, and yet so appreciative of the value of her energetic way that he did not insist on her departure. And so, day after day, for a whole week, Tilda Jane lived on, keeping house for the old man, but saying not one word to him. He would not speak to her, 
and she would not begin a conversation with him she prepared his meals from food that the storekeeper and butcher readily gave her on the old man's account and exercised her tongue by talking to the dogs occasionally she called on her french neighbors the melancons and from them gleaned various items of information about the eccentric mr dillson without however allowing them to know that he would not speak to her this secret she proudly kept to herself she found out from them that the old man was ordinarily in better health than at present that he was usually able to hobble about the house and wait on himself for his temper had of late become so violent that no woman in ciscasset would enter his house to work for him therefore tilda jane's arrival had been most opportune for he would have been in danger of starving to death if left to himself feeling persuaded of this and greatly pleased to think that she had been and was of service to the father of her benefactor hank her attitude towards the old man continued to be one of philosophical and good-natured obstinacy she would not speak to him but she was willing to wait on him in silence looking forward to the time when he would find his tongue her only fear of his sullenness was on behalf of her dogs he hated them she knew it by the menacing tremble of his crutches whenever the animals came within his reach therefore her constant endeavor was to keep them out of his way she had made two soft persuasive beds in the woodshed for them but it was cold there and she could not stay with them they loved her with all the strength of their doggish hearts and wished to be with her every minute of the time often at night she would start up in bed from troubled dreams of a fierce old figure mounting the staircase crutch in hand there was no lock on her bedroom door and if the old man had a sudden accession of strength he could easily push aside the barrier of a washstand and two chairs that she put across this door before she went to bed she wished that hank would come home he might persuade his peculiar parent to end this unnatural silence and give her a chance to become acquainted with him maybe he'll soon come poacher she whispered in the ear of the dog who was sitting close beside her we'll make up our minds for that won't we the dog was sitting up very straight beside her and gazing benevolently down at gippie who lay on her lap they were all out on the front doorstep and tilda jane was knitting industriously it was a day like may in the month of march there was a soft mild air and a warm wind that made dripping eaves and melting snowbanks little streams of water were running from the garden to the road and from the road to the hollow of the river where large cakes of ice were slowly loosening themselves breaking up and floating towards the sea spring was coming and tilda jane despite the incorrigible sulkiness of the person with whom she was living felt it good to have a home we'll have lots of sport by and by running in the fields poacher she whispered lovingly in his ear you old comfort always so sweet and good and never sassing back you just creep away when you see someone comin', and don't say a word do you you're a sample to me i wish i was like you and you never want to be bad do you and chase back to the woods the dog abandoned his stately attitude and gave his tongue a quick fillip in the direction of her forehead no thanks to her intense devotion to him he had no time for mournful reflections on the past but i guess you'd like to see your master sometimes she murmured i see a hankerin in your eyes now and again old feller and then i just talk to you hard you darlin and throwing her arm around his neck she squeezed him heartily he was boldly reciprocating by licking her little straight determined nose when there was a clicking sound around the corner of the house till that jane released him and raised her head the old man was approaching leaning heavily on his crutches the beauty of the day had penetrated and animated even his ancient bones till that jane was delighted to see him moving about but giving no sign of her satisfaction she rose and prepared to enter the house he did not approve of having the front door unlocked 
he did not approve of her habit of dodging out of doors whenever she had no work to do inside she felt this although he had never said it and pushing gippy into the hall she stepped down the walk to pick up her ball of yarn the dog's enemy was some distance away and seeing him leaning so heavily on his crutches it did not occur to her that there could be any fear of danger however with all her acuteness she did not measure the depth of his animosity nor the agility with which it could inspire him with a deafness and lightness that would have been admirable if it had not been cruel the old man bore all his weight on one crutch swung the other around in the air and with a heavy end struck a swift sure blow on poacher's glossy black forehead it was all done in the twinkling of an eye in the short space of time that the little girl's back was turned she heard the crashing blow flashed around and saw the black body of the dog extended on a white snow bank his eyes were open his expression was still the loving one with which he had been regarding her as she stooped to pick up the ball for an instant tilda jane felt no emotion but wonder she stood stock still staring alternately at the old man and at the motionless body of the dog it had occurred to her that he would kill one of her pets if he had a chance but now that he had done it the thing seemed unreal almost absurd surely she was dreaming that was not poacher lying there dead she went up to the dog touched him with soft amazed fingers lifted the velvet ears and put her hands on his forehead there was the slightest ruffling of the smooth skin where the crutch had struck him the old man stood and watched her for a few seconds his face a trifle redder than usual but giving no sign of emotion he watched her until she lifted her head and looked at him then he turned hastily and limped to the back door it was an awful look to see on the face of a child an avenging unforgiving hateful look the look of a grown person in cold profound wrath he did not regret killing the dog he would like to dispose of the other one but he did object to those murderous eyes she was capable of killing him he must get rid of her and make his peace with some of the siscasset witches in order that they might come and wait on him he went thoughtfully into the house and sat down in his usual corner beyond the kitchen stove he wondered whether she would give him any supper he could get it himself to-night if she did not he was certainly better and a glow of pleasure made his blood feel warm in his veins stay there she was coming slowly in he thanked his lucky stars looking very much the same as usual he would not be slain in his bed that night and she was getting fresh wood for the fire perhaps she would make hot cakes for supper she was wonderfully smart for a girl he had several times speculated as to her age sometimes when talking to the dogs she seemed no more than eleven or twelve years old ordinarily she appeared to him about fifteen but small for her age today in her wrath she might be taken for seventeen how subdued she seemed as she moved about the kitchen he had done a good thing to strike down one of those animals she would not have such an independent air now she built up the fire set the tea kettle on the back of the stove he wondered why she did not put it on the front and why she gradually piled on sticks of wood until there was a roaring blaze that caused him some slight uneasiness was she going to set the chimney on fire no she was not when there was a bed of fiery red coals she took up her tiny padded holder lifted off one of the stove covers and to his surprise went into the corner behind him where he kept his crutches what was she going to do and he uneasily turned his head she had both crutches in her hand his polished wooden crutches with the gold plate inscription years ago when he resigned his position as bookkeeper at waysmith and son's big mill a gold-headed cane had been presented to him on which was engraved a flattering inscription 
nothing that had ever been given to him in his life had tickled his vanity as this present from the rich and prosperous firm had done when he had been obliged to put away the cane on account of his increasing bodily infirmities he had had the gold plate inscription transferred to his crutches where he could see it all the time and have others see it now what was she going to do with those crutches he opened his mouth and for the first time addressed her put those crutches down she paid less attention to him than she did to the crackling of the fire walking behind his chair and making a wide circle to avoid his outstretched arms she went to the other side of the stove and he lifted up his voice and roared at her she was sticking the legs of his crutches down in that fiery furnace he roared again but she did not even raise her head she was holding the crutches down stuffing them in burning them off inch by inch very quietly very deliberately but very surely she was not thinking of him she was thinking of the dead dog in the snow he kept quiet for a few seconds then he began to bellow for mercy she was burning up the crossbar handles she would soon reach that gold plate inscription and now for the first time he knew what those eulogistic words were to him he a man who had had the temper of a maniac that had cut him off from the sympathy of every human being he knew tears ran down his cheeks in incoherent words he stammered an apology for killing her dog and then she relented throwing the charred and smoking tops to him she shut up the stove took her hat and tippet from a peg in the wall and clasping gippie to her left the house without one glance at the old man as he sat in the smoky atmosphere mumbling to himself and fumbling over the burned pieces of wood as tenderly as if they had been babies she had conquered him but without caring for her conquest she left him end of chapter seventeen Chapter 18 of Tilda Jane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Dini Stain, Kelowna, Canada. Tilda Jane by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 18. In Search of a Perfect Man. Siskasset, perhaps most beautiful of Maine towns near the Canadian border, was particularly beautiful on the morning after Tilda Jane's departure from Hobart Dilson's cottage. The sun was shining fervently, so fervently that men threw open their top coats or carried them on their arms. The sky was still of the delicate pink and blue haze of the day before. The wind was a breath of spring blown at departing winter. It was still early, and beautiful Siskasset was not yet really astir. Few women were to be seen on the streets, only a score of shop girls hurrying to their work, but men abounded. Clerks were going to their desks and counters, and early rising businessmen to their offices. Market men swarmed in from the country in order to be the first to sell their produce in the prosperous little town with the Indian name. Other towns and villages might direct their search across the sea for European titles for streets and homes. Siskasset prided itself on being American and original. The Indian names were native to the state, and with scarcely an exception prevailed in the nomenclature of the town. Therefore, the, in other places, Main Street, was here Kennebago Street, and down this street a group of farmers was slowly proceeding. They had sold their farm produce to grocers and stable keepers, and were now going to the post office for their mail. Assembled a few moments later in a corner of the grey stone building, and diligently reading letters and papers, they did not see a small figure approaching, and only looked up when a grave voice inquired, "'Are you too busy to speak to me a minute?' The men all stared at the young girl with the dog in her arms, the heavy circles around her eyes, and the two red spots on her cheeks. "'What do you want?' 
asked the oldest farmer, a gray-haired man in a rabbit-skin cap. I want to find the best minister in this place. A smile went around the circle of farmers. They were all amused, except the gray-haired one. He was the nearest to Tilda Jane and felt the intense gravity of her manner. In the town, I mean, she went on wearily. I want to ask him something. I thought they'd know in the post office, but when I asked behind them boxes, and she nodded towards the wall near them, they told me to get out. They was busy. The old farmer was silent for a moment. Then he said gruffly, You look beat out, young girl, like as if you'd been out all night. I was, she said simply. I've been pacing the streets, waiting for the morning. The attitude of the younger men was half reproachful, half disturbed. They always brought with them to the town an uneasy consciousness that they might in some way be fooled, and Tilda Jane's air was very precocious, very citified, compared with their air of rustic cultishness. They did not dream that she was country-bred like themselves. The older man was thinking. He was nearer the red spots and the grieving eyes than the others. The child was in trouble. Bill, he said slowly, what's the name of that man that holds forth in Mulunka Street Church? His son informed him that he did not know. How do you do, Mr. Price, said the farmer, leaving the young farmers and sauntering across to the other side of the post office, where a brisk-looking man was ripping open letters. Can you give us the name of the preacher that wags his tongue in the church on Mulunka Street? Burness said Mr. Price, raising his head and letting his snapping eyes run beyond the farmer to the flock of young men huddling together like grey sheep. Would you call him the best man in Ciscasset? pursued the farmer with a wave of his hand towards Tilda Jane. Mr. Price's snapping eyes had already taken her in. What do you mean by best? he asked coolly. I mean, a man as always does what is right, said Tilda Jane when the question was left for her to answer. Don't go to Burness, then, said Mr. Price rapidly. Good preacher, poor practiser. Ain't there any good practisers in Ciscasset? asked the farmer dryly. Well, I know some pretty fair ones, responded Mr. Price. I don't know of one perfect person in the length and breadth of the town, but I know two people, though, who come near enough to perfection for your job, I guess and his brilliant glance rested on Tilda Jane. Who be they? asked the farmer curiously. Is it this young girl that wants em? asked Mr. Price. Yes, sir, said the farmer. It is. Then I'll tell her, said his quicksilver friend, and he flashed to Tilda Jane's side. Go up Willustook Road to Alaguash Street. Ask for Reverend Mr. Tracy's house. Anyone will tell you, understand? Yes, sir, thank you, and thank you, too. And with a grateful gesture towards the farmer, she was gone. The farmer gazed after her. I hate to see a young one in trouble. Someone's been imposing on her. Mr. Price felt sympathetic, but he said nothing. Who'd you send her to? inquired the farmer. I'd give a barrel of apples to know. To me? inquired Mr. Price smartly. The farmer laughed. Yes, sir, I'd do it. You'd put me in the way of business before now. I sent her to a man, replied Mr. Price, who might be in Boston today if he wanted to. He gave up a big church to come here. He's always inveining against luxury and selfishness and the other crowd of vices. He and his wife has stacks of money, but they give it away and never do the peacock act. They're about as good as they make em. It isn't their talking I care about, not one rap, it's the carrying out of their talk and not going back on it. My daughter wants to go out as a hired help. I guess that would be an A number one place if they'd have her, observed the farmer meditatively. Good enough, said Mr. Price, if you want her to ruin her earthly prospects and better her heavenly ones, and went away laughing. The farmer stepped to the post office door. Tilda Jane was toiling up the sidewalk with downcast head. The shop windows had no attractions for her, nor was she throwing a single glance at the line of vehicles now passing along the street, and muttering, poor young one, the farmer returned to his correspondence. 
the reverend mr tracy was having his breakfast in the big yellow house set up on terraces which were green in summer and white in winter the house was large because it was meant to shelter other people beside the tracys and their children but there was not a stick of gentil furniture in it the new housemaid from portland was just disdainfully observing to the cook you'll get over that soon remarked the cook with a laugh and a toss of her head and we'll be for givin away what we've got and sittin on the floor there's the doorbell you'd better go answer it it's time the beggars was arrivin mr tracy was late with his breakfast that morning because he had been out half the night before with a drunken young man who had showed an inconquerable aversion to returning home now as he ate his chop and drank his hot milk fed a parrot by his side and talked to his wife who kept moving about in the room he thought of this young man until he caught the sound of voices in the hall bessie he said quietly there's your new maid turning someone away his wife stepped into the hall the housemaid was indeed assuring a poor-looking child that the master of the house was at breakfast and could not see any one. Then I'll wait, Mrs. Tracy heard in a dogged young voice. The front door closed as she hurried forward, but she quickly opened it. There on the top step sat a small girl holding a dog. Good morning, she said kindly. Do you want something? I want to see Reverend Tracy, responded the little girl and the clergyman's wife used to sorrowful faces felt her heart ache as this most sorrowful one was upturned to her come in she went on until the jane found herself speedily walking through a wide but bare hall to a sunny dining-room she paused on the threshold that small dark man must be the minister he was no nearer beauty than she was but he had a good face and let her rejoice for this he was fond of animals for on the hearth lay a cat and a dog asleep side by side in the long windows hung canaries in cages and on a luxuriant and beautiful rose bush growing in a big pot drawn up to the table sat a green and very self-possessed parrot she was not screeching she was not tearing at the leaves she sat meekly and thankfully receiving from time to time such morsels as her master chose to hand her the little dark, quiet man barely turned as she entered, but his one quick glance told him more than hours of conversation from Tilda Jane would have revealed. He did not get up. He did not shake hands with her. He merely nodded and uttered a brief good morning. "'Won't you sit here?' said Mrs. Tracy, bustling to the fireplace and disturbing the cat and dog in order to draw up a chair." i think our young caller will have some breakfast with me said the minister without raising his eyes and stretching out his hand he pushed a chair beyond the rose bush and by a gesture invited tilda jane to sit in it she seated herself crowded gippy on her lap under the table and mechanically put to her mouth the cup of steaming milk that seemed to glide to her hand she was nearly fainting a few minutes more and she would have fallen to the floor the minister did not speak to her he went calmly on with his breakfast and a warning finger uplifted kept his wife from making remarks he talked a good deal to the parrot and occasionally to himself and not until tilda jane had finished the milk and eaten some bread and butter did any one address her then the minister spoke to the bird say good morning to the little girl lulu good morning remarked the parrot in a voice of grating amiability say it's a pretty world lulu continued the owner it's a pretty world darling responded the parrot bursting into hoarse unmusical laughter at her own addition oh it's a pretty world a pretty world to the gentleman and his wife there was something cynical and afflicting in the bird's comments on mundane affairs and they surreptitiously examined their visitor did she feel this she did poor girl she had been passing through some bitter experience there was the haunting injured look of wounded childhood on her face and her curled lip showed that she too young as she was had found that all was not good in the world all was not beautiful the parrot was singing now mid pleasures and palaces though we may roam 
be it ever so humble there's no place like home 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 sweet sweet home but at this point she overbalanced herself her uplifted claw swung over and she fell backward among the rose branches the bird's rueful expression as she fell her ridiculous one as she gathered herself up and with a surprised oh dear climbed back to her perch were so overcoming that the minister and his wife burst into hearty laughter tilda jane did not join them she looked interested and a very faint crease of amusement came in a little fold about her lips but at once faded away the minister got up and went to the fire and taking out his watch earnestly consulted its face then addressed his wife i have a minister's meeting in half an hour can you go downtown with me yes dear replied mrs tracy and she glanced expectantly towards tilda jane the little girl started can i ask you a question or so afore you go she asked hurriedly no my dear said the man with a fatherly air not until i come back i guess someone's told you about me remarked tilda jane bitterly i never heard of you or saw you before a quarter of an hour ago he replied kindly do you see that sofa and he drew aside a curtain you lie down there and rest and in two hours we shall return come bessie and with his wife he left the room tilda jane was confounded and her first idea was of capture she was trapped at last and would be sent back to the asylum then a wave of different feelings swept over her she would trust those two people anywhere and they liked her she could tell it by their looks and actions she sighed heavily almost staggered to the sofa and throwing herself down was in two minutes sleeping the sleep of utter exhaustion End of chapter 18chapter nineteen of tilda jane this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen tilda jane by marshall saunders chapter nineteen sweet and soft repentance she was awakened by a hoarse whisper in her ear get up and go on get up and go on don't crow don't crow her eyelids felt as heavy as lead it seemed as if she would rather die than stir her sluggish limbs yet she moved slightly as the rough whisper went on get up and go on get up and go on don't croak don't croak it was the parrot with the cold in her throat and she was perched on the sofa cushioned by her head tilda jane raised herself on one hand how weary how unspeakably weary she was if she could only lie down again and what was the matter with her why had she waked with that terrible feeling of unhappiness she remembered now poacher was gone she had not shed a tear over him before but now she hid her face in her hands and indulged in low and heart-broken lamentation poor poacher dear handsome dog she would never see him again what would the lucases say if they knew of his untimely end what should she do without him and she cried miserably until the sound of voices in the next room recalled her to herself she was in the minister's house and she must get her business over with and be gone so choking back her emotion she wiped her face smoothed her dress and followed by jippy stepped into the dining-room the minister was seated by the fire reading to his wife he got up when he saw tilda jane gave her a chair then went on with his book after some time he laid it down his collar was composed now and something told him that she was ready to consult him he smiled a beautiful gentle smile at her and thus encouraged she swallowed the lump in her throat and began i'm obliged to you sir for lettin me sleep and givin me some breakfast and can i tell you somethin bout myself i'm all kind o scatterwise and you wish someone to straighten you out he asked benevolently yes sir and i thought the best person would be a minister they said you was the best here mrs tracy smiled in a gratified fashion while tilda jane went earnestly on i'm all mixy maxy and i feel as if i hadn't started right 
i guess i'll tell you just where i come from i s'pose you know the middle marston orphan asylum the minister told her that he had heard of it he did not tell her that he had heard it was one of the few badly managed institutions for orphans in the state that the children were kept strictly fed poorly and were rapidly institutionalized while under the care of uneducated ignorant women who were only partially supervised by a vacillating board of lady managers well i was riz there continued tilda jane rized mostly in trouble but still i was riz and the ladies paid for me and i didn't take that into count when i run away so you ran away he said encouragingly yes sir count of this dog i said and she pointed to jippy but i guess inside of me twas as much for myself i didn't like the asylum i wanted to run away even when there was no talk o the dog and i'll tell you what happened and while the minister and his wife courteously listened she gave a full and entire account of her wanderings during the time that she had been absent from the asylum she told them of hank dillson of her sojourn at vanceboro and her experience with the lucases and finally her story brought her down to the events of the day before when that old man kneeled over my dog she said brokenly that dog as had saved my life i wanted murder i wish something would strike him dead but he didn't fall dead and then i thought it was time for me to chip in and do something i took them crutches as he can't move without and i burnt em most up all but a little bit at the top with the gold writin cause he sits and gazes at it and i guess sets store by it you burnt hobart dillson's crutches exclaimed mrs tracy in surprise yes ma'am cause he killed my dog i wonder he had not struck you down said the lady with a shudder he is said to be a man with a very violent temper tilda jane sprang up her face as white as a sheet i most forgot i s'pose he's sittin there this minute he can't move without em and nobody'll go near him now sir and she turned in desperate haste to the little dark silent man tell me quick what i ought to do you are a child with a conscience he said gravely you have been turning the matter over in your own mind what conclusion have you reached go on said the parrot hoarsely and between intervals of climbing by means of bill and claw to the top of a chair go on and don't croak don't croak tilda jane turned her solemn face toward the bird walkin to and fro last night a verse o scripter kept comin to me children obey your parents in the lord now i ain't got any parents but i had lady boards i oughtn't to a run away i ought to have give up the dog and trusted i ought to a begged them to get me a home i ought to a been a better girl then i might a been dopted ever since i've run away there's been trouble 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 nothing but trouble i've led another dog astray and now he's dead mr and mrs tracy exchanged a pitying glance the child was intensely in earnest her black eyes were bent absently on the parrot who had fallen prey to an immense curiosity with regard to jippy and having surveyed him from the back of the chair and the mantel and finding him harmless was now walking cautiously around him as he lay on the hearth rug presently emboldened by his silence she took the end of his tail in her beak he did not move and she gently pinched it there was a squeal a rush and a discomfited parrot minus three tail feathers flying to her master's shoulder oh my she exclaimed my my what a fuss what a fuss very little attention was paid her her master and mistress were taken up with the youthful owner of the dog but mr tracy mechanically stroked the bird as he put another question to tilda jane and what do you propose to do i think i ought to go back she said earnestly i ought to say i'm sorry i ought to say i'll do better go back where asked mrs tracy eagerly first to the old man i ought to be civil to him i ought to talk and not be mum like an oyster i ought to ask him if he wants me to go away i ought to write the lady boards and tell em where i be i ought to say i'll go back do you wish to go back asked mr tracy a shiver passed over tilda jane's slight frame but she spoke up bravely i ain't a-goin to think o that sir i've got to do what's right and what about your dog oh jippy ain't in it at all she said with animation 
he don't need to go i guess i'll find some nice home for him with somebody as likes any miles and a shrewd and melancholy smile hovered about her tense lips as she gazed at her host and hostess poor little girl said mrs tracy sympathetically we will take your dog and you too you shall not go back you shall live with us as she spoke her big blue eyes filled with tears and she laid a caressing hand on tilda jane's shoulder please don't do that ma'am said the little girl vehemently and slipping her shoulder from under the embracing hand please don't do anything homey to me treat me as if i was a real orphan a real orphan repeated mrs tracy in slight bewilderment oh i want a home cried the little girl clenching her hands and raising her face to the ceiling i want some one to talk to me as if i had blue eyes and curly hair i want a little rocking-chair and a fire i don't want to mind bells and run with a crowd o orphans but it ain't the will o providence i've got to give up and her hands sank to her sides and her head fell on her breast mrs tracy bit her lip and pressed her hands together will you stay to dinner with us my dear said mr tracy softly i will take you into my study where there is a fire and a rocking-chair and you shall see some curiosities that i picked up in palestine oh no sir i must go and she again became animated that old man i must see him tell me sir just what i am to do i've been doing all the talkin and i wanted to hear you i guess i'm crazy and she pressed her hands nervously over her ears she was in a strange state of nervous exaltation that was the natural reaction from her terrible dejection of the evening before she had decided to make a martyr of herself a willing martyr and mr tracy would not detain her go back to mr dillson's my dear you have mapped out your own course i do not need to advise you your conscience has spoken and you are listening to its voice go and god bless you you shall hear from us tilda jane was about to rush away but mrs tracy detained her wait an instant i have something for you and she hurried from the room End of chapter nineteen chapter twenty of tilda jane this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen tilda jane by marshall saunders chapter twenty waiting mr dillson had not passed a pleasant night in the first place he had not been able to move for a long time after tilda jane's departure for half an hour he had sat hoping that she would return or that some one would call on some errand without his crutches he was helpless strange to say he was not in a rage with her indeed he had never felt more kindly disposed toward her and he certainly had never so longed for a sight of her little thin ungraceful figure just at the moment of the burning of the crutches he could have felled her to the earth but after it was an accomplished fact his lack of resentment was a marvel even to himself possibly it was because she had saved the gold plate possibly as minute after minute went by it was because a peculiar fear drove all vengeance from his mind he had not liked the look in her eyes when she went out suppose she should make way with herself suppose she should jump into a hole in the ice or throw herself in front of a locomotive or do any other of the foolish things that desperate and maddened people were in the habit of doing what would then be his position not an enviable one by any means he was partly not wholly for he had some shreds of vanity left aware of his neighbor's opinion respecting himself there was an ugly word they might connect with his name and he glowered over the fire and felt sufficiently uncomfortable until a strange and marvellous thing happened the kitchen was in an l of the house and by hitching his chair around he could command a view from the side window of a slice of the garden in front and also of a narrow strip of the road before the house he would watch this strip and if a passer-by appeared would hail him or her and beg to have a new pair of crutches ordered from the town 
it was while he was sitting in the gathering gloom watching this bit of highway that the marvellous thing happened just by the corner of the house was a black patch on the snow the hind legs and tail of the poor deceased poacher the forefront of the body was beyond his vision dillson had no particular dislike for the spectacle a dead dog was a more pleasant sight than a living one to him and he was just wondering whom he would get to remove the animal when he imagined that he saw the tail move no it was only his imperfect vision and he rubbed his eyes and moistened his glasses now the tail was no longer there the hind legs were no longer there had someone come up the front walk and drawn the creature away he pressed his face close against the window-pane no there was the dog himself on his feet and walking about first in a staggering fashion then more correctly the old man eagerly raised the window if the girl lived and was going about saying that he had killed her dog here was the proof positive that he had not and smacking his lips and making a clicking sound with his tongue he tried to attract the resuscitated poacher's attention he must capture the animal and keep him it was years since he had called a dog not since he was a young man and had gone hunting on the marshes below the town here dog dog he said impatiently good dog poacher gravely advanced to the window and stood below him good dog repeated the old man hi jump in and he held the window higher the dog would not jump while the enemy was there he would not have jumped at all if he had been at the back door for he would have smelled his mistress's tracks and gone after her now he suspected that she was in the house though every movement gave him agony the old man hobbled away from the window the dog sprang in and dillson clapped the sash down he had the animal now poacher was running around the room sniffing vigorously he stood on his hind legs and smelled at the peg where the hat and tippet had hung then he ran to the woodshed door with a most unusual exertion of strength the old man rose pushed the chair before him and breathing hard and resting heavily on it opened the cellar door he would shut the dog down there out of sight and where he could not run out if any one came in she's down there dog he said and the boldness with which he told the story so impressed poacher that after one inquiring glance which convinced him that his enemy's attitude had changed from that of a murderess to a semi-friendly one he dashed down the steps into the cold cellar dillson slammed the door and chuckled now to get back to the window he tried to hitch his chair along but he was weak and must rest he sat for a few minutes and when the few minutes were over he found that his muscles had stiffened he could not move he sat a little longer the fire went out and the room got cold he was so far from the window that he doubted if any one could hear him if he shouted he lifted up his voice to try he was as hoarse as a crow he had a cold and it was every minute getting worse if he had the dog from the cellar he might tie something to him and frighten him so that he would go dashing through a window he began to feel that if the little girl did not return he might sit there till he died his case was not desperate yet however he waited and waited the night came and went and another morning dawned and the weather changed outside until a stiff frost began to transform the thaw into a return of winter weather and still he waited but the little girl did not come end of chapter twenty chapter twenty one of tilda jane this is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox dot org recording by kathleen tilda jane by marshall saunders chapter twenty one the tiger becomes a lamb jippy was tired out and in an execrable temper he had had to trot home all the way from the tracys for his mistress was carrying a long bundle under one arm and a good-sized basket on the other and now that she was in sight of the house she was fairly running and he could scarcely keep up with her 
her head was turned far round she was looking over her shoulder in the direction away from the front of the house and yet she went right to the spot where the unfortunate poacher had fallen jippy knew very well what all her emotion was about like some deaf and partly blind human beings he was more aware of happenings than people supposed poacher was dead and he was not sorry for it for he had been desperately jealous of him and limping up to his mistress he impatiently whined to claim recognition oh jippy what shall i do she moaned what shall i do he was so good and gentle i can't go in i can't go in she was on her knees on the snow her hands were wandering over the depression where poacher had lain her face was so pale and unhappy that even jippy's selfish heart was touched and standing on his hind legs to reach her shoulder he tenderly licked her right ear inside and out until she brushed him aside with a half laugh half sob and a murmured you tickle my ear jippy she got up and moved slowly toward the back door while the dog trotted along nimbly on his three legs after her why what a vault and jippy shivered and turned his short-sighted eyes in the direction of the kitchen stove it was black and cold and the old man sitting in the draughtiest corner of the room right by the cellar door was a dull mottled purple he did not speak when the door opened he was morose and silent and his whole appearance was that of a man in extreme distress jippy was an excellent hater and it did him good to see the old man suffer however he did not care to suffer with him and squealing dismally he planted himself near the delinquent stove tilda jane's listlessness and painful depression were gone with a quick exclamation she had dropped her basket and bundle and had sprung to the kindling box there was nothing in it she rushed to the woodshed came back with a handful of sticks and paper and by dint of extra quick movements had in an astonishingly short pace of time a good fire roaring up the chimney then she turned to the old man who was still sitting in the stony silence i'm afraid you're most froze sir can't you come nigher the fire dillson's eyelids were swollen with the cold but there was still room for a disagreeable twinkle to glimmer through he would say nothing however and tilda jane approaching the long peculiar-looking bundle opened it took out a pair of crutches and handed them to him with a humble supplicating air jippy crawled farther under the stove and lowering his head awaited developments but there was no danger of a blow from the old man his hands were so benumbed that he could not hold the crutches they slipped to the floor with a crash and opening his purple lips he ejaculated the word tea ain't you had nothin since i left inquired tilda jane sharply dillson shook his head you ain't been sittin there all night he nodded his head this time tilda jane's face took on an expression of dismay and she flew around the kitchen the warm atmosphere was now enwrapping the old man in a most agreeable manner and when tilda jane handed him the big cup he grunted something between an expression of thanks and a desire that she should hold it to his lips while he greedily drank the hot liquid tilda jane with a queer choking in her throat addressed broken remarks to him i didn't know sir i was hopin some one would come in i was most crazy about the dog i forgot all about you till just now more he said shortly when tilda jane put the cup down she refilled it then as his hands began to get supple and he could manipulate it himself she uncovered the basket mrs tracy had given her i didn't look in before she exclaimed oh the beauty eggs and she carefully unrolled a napkin and the white rolls and washington cake and a meat pie and a tart i say grandpa will have a good dinner the old man looked strangely at her but she went on unheedingly they're just boss people i'm glad i went and talked to em i'm sorry i was so ugly to you grandpa and if you don't want me i guess i'd better go away she spoke quite humbly and naturally and as she did so she raised her head and glanced in dillson's direction 
he made no response and she went on i've been a very bad little girl but i'm goin to be better and you just tell me what you want me to do grandpa and i'll do it and if you don't want to talk you just write it i know you're a big man and mebby you don't want to talk to a little girl like me but i'll not lay it up agin you you just do what you want and i'm not tryin to come round you cause i spect you'll send me off quicker in a flash so soon as you get someone else her lips were trembling and her face was bright and expectant but the old man gave her no satisfaction hand me some of that pie he said unexpectedly can you wait till i set the table and make it look real pretty grandpa she said coaxingly dillson was nearly starved and without a word held out his hand in a commanding fashion all right grandpa she said gently and she handed him a generous slice anything you like this is your house it ain't mine dillson ate his pie watching her meanwhile out of a corner of his eye bread and meat he said when he had finished tilda jane supplied this want and earnestly watched these viands going the way of the pie more tea he said when they got gone when he had eaten and drunk to an alarming extent he pointed to the crutches where did you get them i saw em in a window grandpa a great big druggist's window and i went in and said to the man can you trust me for em i'll pay you sure pop if you'll give me time i'm goin to be a good girl now and never tell no more lies nor steal nor do anything bad but he just said ever so grumpy this is a cast down no credit system store but i wasn't cast down and i said s'pose you was a lame man and a bad little girl burnt up your crutches how would you feel then he looked kind o solemn and said whose crutches was burnt up and i said mr hobart dillson's crutches and he said what girl burnt em i said a little girl that don't know where to look then he asked what you said when i burnt your crutches and i said you didn't say much you just cussed then he turned his face round to the bottles and when he looked out it was red and he was shaken all over like as if he's been cryin and he just pointed to the crutches and said take em and welcome dillson's head dropped on his breast this girl had evidently gone to peter jurrett's store peter jurrett who had owed him a grudge ever since the day he went in and denounced him before a store full of customers for overcharging him for prescriptions peter had actually dared to pity him hobart dillson and so he let the girl have the crutches not caring whether he ever got paid or not well he hadn't thought peter would ever pity him and drawing his crutches toward him dillson cautiously lifted himself and tried his weight upon them yes he could walk he would go to bed and think over peter's conduct it affected him but he must not look soft open my door he said to tilda jane while she flew to obey his command the old man heard a low whine near him and remembered poacher the dog had recognized the girl's voice and would soon make himself known he might as well have the credit of his discovery if she had come home sulky he would have allowed her to find the dog for herself but she was meek and biddable and she had also secretly pleased him by addressing him as grandpa in tones of such respect and affection she had improved decidedly and he exclaimed peremptorily hear you tilda jane ran out from the bedroom where she was turning down the icy sheets in the bed so that the chill might be taken from them open this door ordered the old man with a wondering air tilda jane threw back the cellar door then she gave a joyful scream there standing on the top step cold and shivering half famished but alive and well was her beloved poacher she tried to catch him around the neck but he flew past her into the kitchen came back like a shot and dashing up her back licked her neck sprang into the air and again racing round and round the room brought on what she herself would call a combobberation the old man was so near 
that poacher in his wild gyrations to and fro swept one of his crutches from him tilda jane even in the midst of her astonished and ecstatic glee perceived this and stooped down to recover the lost article but she could not lay her hand on it for the excited dog with his head in the air and his tongue hanging out made repeated dashes at her beside her behind her he was everywhere that she was and jippy was after him for snorting with rage and mortification at the resuscitation of his rival he had bounded from under the stove and with his maimed tail wagging excitedly in the air was biting snapping growling at poacher's heels nipping him fiercely if not by chance he paused a second to rest the noise and confusion were overcoming and the old man holding firmly to his remaining crutch and grasping the back of a chair grimly surveyed the scene finally tilda jane secured the crutch and pantingly brushing back her dishevelled hair she passed it to him across the dog's backs poacher had now sunk on the floor at her feet while jippy was exerting his feeble strength in trying to crowd him away from tilda jane's stout shoe forgive us grandpa dear grandpa she said beseechingly but it's such a joyful occasion such occasion my heart never felt so big in my life it's all swolled up oh ain't you sweet to prepare this surprise for me when i come back just now i thought my pet was buried in the cold ground oh i just love you and climbing over the quarrelling dogs she seized the bunch of knuckles nearest her and kissed them fervently the old man slowly uncurled his fist and looked at it how many years was it since any one had kissed him he put the crutch under his arm and turned toward the bedroom good-night grandpa dear grandpa floated sweetly after him the girl was down on the floor with her dogs her arm was around the hound's black neck the three-legged atrocity was pressed to her side she was happy yes happy as happy as a fool he grumbled to himself nothing to annoy her nothing to trouble her wait till she got older and life's worries began to crowd around her and with an impatient groan the old man flung himself down on the chair by his bed End of chapter twenty one Chapter Twenty Two of Tilda Jane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Drew Conway, Kent. Tilda Jane by Marshall Saunders. Chapter Twenty Two A Troubled Mind. Tilda Jane and grandpa were sitting out in front of the house the spring months had passed the apple trees had blossomed and the young apples had formed with the change in season had come happier days for tilda jane little by little as the weeks slipped by a better understanding had arisen between her and grandpa he still gave way occasionally to terrible fits of temper and sullenness but Tilda Jane understood him better now, and was quite quick to soothe and pacify him, or, if he was unmanageable, to keep out of his presence until he recovered. Just now he was in an unusually amiable frame of mind, a frame of mind so accommodating that he boded storms in the near future. However, Tilda Jane did not care. She accepted the present peace and was thankful. She had dragged out his big rocking chair for him to sit on, and had given him an evening paper to read, while she herself was curled up on her favourite seat on the doorstep. The old man was not inclined to read his paper, and dropping it on his knees, he took off his glasses, put them in his pocket, and let his eyes wander to the apple trees. The river was flowing blue and open now. Birds were singing, and all things betokened a fine summer. When you hear those robins sing, don't it feel as if there was a little string squeaking inside of you? said Tilda Jane gleefully. 
Dilson made no reply, and seeing that he was in no mood for a sympathetic comparison of emotions, she diplomatically started another topic of conversation. I guess the birds make me glad, cause I'm so happy you let me bide with you, Grandpa, and you've been so noble and generous to lend me money to pay for the matron's shawl I took for Gippy, and it was so kind in the lady boards to write back that they was glad to get rid of me. The old man laughed a toothless laugh at her whimsical view of the lady board's reply, but said nothing. I ain't told you much of my travels yet, Grandpa, she said agreeably. I've been so busy house-cleaning. I guess you'd like to hear about Van Saboro. The old man did not display any particular interest in Van Saboro, but having assured herself by swift examination of his features that the subject was not disagreeable to him, she went on. It's a great old place. I'd like you to go there some time, Grandpa. Such goings-on with them foreigners. I saw one woman walking up and down, wringing her hands and crying because they wouldn't let her bring her old mother into this nation. She waited for her hearer to ask why the mother was forbidden to come where the daughter could enter and he did not do so, and she continued, she was a poor woman from Boston, and her mother was a poor woman from Canada, and they said if she come in, twould be two poor women together, and first thing they'd knowed, they'd be both in the poorhouse, so her mother had to go back to Canada. Dilson looked entirely uninterested in the case of the would-be immigrant, so, after a farewell announcement that sometimes as many as two hundred foreigners went through Van Saboro in a single day, Tilda Jane passed on to another branch of her subject. It's a regular jubilee, Grandpa, when the trains come in, a boy running to a big bell and ringing it, and people pouring into the lunch room and just chasing the food into their mouths and looking hunted like as if there was something after them, and some don't take time to go to the tables. They step up to the lunch counter, which is shaped just like a moon when it ain't full. There's glass dishes on it with oranges and bananas and cakes and pies and sandwiches, and a funny machine when you drop a nickel in a crack, and if the hand points to five or ten or fifteen, you get twenty-five cents worth of candy. And if you don't get candy, you get good advice, like as, you've been keeping bad company, quit it or you'll never prosper, or you've run away from home and the perlis is on your track, or smoking is a bad thing for your health. Grandpa was not very much interested, so Tilda Jane tried something more startling. There's great talk of railroad accidents there, men get killed awful. I heard a table girl ask a brakeman how he could go on a train for fear he'd be hurt, and he said he doesn't stop to think, and he had to take chances. I used to see em running like cats on top of them cars, slippery with snow and ice. If you're inside one of them cars, Grandpa, and there's going to be a turnover, just grip hard on something steady, cause then you're not so apt to get killed. I heard a conductor say that. Grandpa's travelling days were over, yet it pleased him to be talked to as if he was still a strong and active man, and he said shortly, I'm not likely to be going far from home. You don't know, Grandpa, she said soothingly. Some day, when you get nice and well, I'd like to travel with you, but first you must be very quiet, like one of Job's mice and not have anything gnawing at you. I guess you've had lots of plague times in your life. Grandpa looked unheedingly beyond her to the apple trees. Her face was strewed and puckered, and she was surveying him like a cunning little cat. Sometimes, Grandpa, I hear you fussing in your sleep, moaning and crying like a poor dog what's lost her pups. The old man turned and looked at her sharply. She went on boldly. Can I lie in my soft, warm bed upstairs and you suffering? 
no i creepy creep down to see if i can do anything don't you do that again said the old man his face becoming red you stay in your bed at night all right grandpa she said meekly but i've heard things already things what things he asked sharply tilda jane folded together the apron she was hemming and getting up opened a door of retreat behind her into the house about losing that money she said sadly she paused and as he neither spoke or made any motion to throw a crutch at her she proceeded grandpa i just know it's like a little pain hawk picking at your skin grandpa was still silent painfully so and she hurried on you haven't got much money and you have me and the dogs to take care of now grandpa won't you let me get some work to do outside to help us and she screwed her features into their most persuasive appearance grandpa had his head turned away over his shoulder and when he after a long time twisted it around tilda jane rose and prudently and swiftly retired into the hall he must be in a rage his face was fiery and he was making a choking spluttering sound in his throat a sound that only came from him in moments of agitation don't you don't you he stammered spy on me again and bother your young head about things you know nothing of do you hear and he accentuated his remarks by a tap of his crutch on the doorstep i've had a way all my life of taking over things in my sleep and you've got enough to do at home i'll not have you working for other people all right grandpa said tilda jane submissively and she made a step toward him she had planned to fly through the hall to his bedroom and remove his washbowl and pitcher for since she had come to the cottage he had broken several in his fits of rage but grandpa was not angry in a violent way this time he's more bothered than mad she murmured dispiritedly and she drew aside to allow him to pass by her into the house the dew's falling he muttered as he went by her i'll go sit in the kitchen a spell tilda jane went mournfully to sit under the trees on a wooden bench that grandpa had had made for her the two dogs curled themselves up at her feet and with a sigh she picked up a writing pad beside her it was almost too dark to see the lines but she must finish a letter that she had begun to write to hank his former custom had been to scratch a line to his father once in six months to say he was alive and well but since tilda jane's arrival he had written every week and had addressed the letters to her it was a great pleasure to the little girl to get these letters and an equal pleasure to answer them she related to him every occurrence of her daily life all details of his father's conduct except disagreeable ones and her letters always ended with an urgent request that he would come and visit them this evening she had as usual made an appeal at the end of her letter dear mr hank it seems a long time since the snow was on the ground i guess if you knew how much we want to see you you'd come hurrying home the dogs send love gippy especially cos he knows you poacher says he'd be happy to make your acquaintance and mr hank your father's kind of worried about something i guess he'd like to see you end of chapter 22 recording by drew conway kent chapter 23 of tilda jane this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Drew Conway, Kent. Tilda Jane by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 23. An Unexpected Appearance. While Tilda Jane wrote, Poacher suddenly made a stealthy movement 
and Gippy, deaf as he was, had enough of the dog's spirit left in him to know that someone was coming and to elevate the tiny V-shaped flaps over his ears. The gate clicked. There was a rustling along the ribbon glass bordering the narrow path, and then Tilda Jane's writing pad fell to the ground, and she sprang up with a delighted scream. For peering forward in the gathering gloom, she discovered Hank, the long absent Hank, moving heavily and awkwardly up the path towards her. He had grown thin, his clothes hung loosely on him, and he was pale and worried in appearance, but Tilda Jane did not criticise him. He was the person who had most helped her in her search for a home, and springing toward him, she caught his arm and ejaculated, "'Oh, Hank, Mr. Hank, is it truly you? I'm pinching, or is it a ghost?' He smiled faintly, and in return pinched her cheek. I ain't a ghost yet, though upon my word I didn't know but what I'd soon be one. As he spoke, he threw himself wearily on the seat. Well, Tilda, how does Ciscasset treat you? Coronation, you're getting fat, and he scanned her in satisfaction. I wouldn't know you for the little runaway that held me up last March up Marston. I guess I'm getting fat cause I'm peaceful in my mind, said Tilda Jane demurely. I don't have no one to fight. I'm just having the softest time. So father really treats you well? Of course. Don't I write you? He's just as sweet as a peach. He lets me wash and scrub and cook and never says a word except not to work too hard. And if he wants to be just a little bit cranky, just a teeny little bit, he goes in his room and shuts the door till the bad spirit gets out of him. Did he ever hurt you? No, he never struck me. He isn't too like the dogs. Hank had never been told of Poacher's adventure, but his attention wandered to the dog, and he absently stroked his head. You've done the old man a lot of good, he said at last. I? No, sir, said Tilda Jane earnestly. I guess it's the dogs but he wants more good done to him. He's in a regular slouch of despond sometimes, Mr. Hank. Is he? said the young man listlessly. What's he desponding about? About money, Mr. Hank. He lost some in the street, and he never got it back. Then it costs him something to keep me and the dogs. I feel dreadful about it. I try to eat just as little as possible, but I'm as hungry as a bear most of the time. Hank's attention was roused. You must not stench yourself, sissy. This is too bad. I'm to blame. I've been intending to send you some money, but I've had a round of bad luck. His face was so disturbed that Tilda Jane made haste to change the subject. Oh, I'm so worked up to see you. I'm perfectly toxicated. I feel just like the kettle for it boils, and that minds me I must go and set it on. You must be starving. No, I ain't hungry. I haven't had an appetite for a week, but how much did father lose? Sixty dollars, said the little girl reluctantly. Hank relapsed into silence after this information. He was evidently not inclined to talk, but Tilda Jane was brimful of questions and presently burst out with one of them. Mr. Hank, what did you do with that beauty horse of yours? Had to sell it, he said bitterly. I've lost everything I had. Those farmers are all against me. Every potato top among them. I'm played out in this state. They'd like to jowl me if they could. Jowl you, said Tilda Jane resentfully. I guess I'd come and pound at the door of the jail if they did. You ought to pound, said Hank in an ungrateful and ungallant tone, cause I ain't had a mite of luck since you crossed my path. Tilda Jane fell into blank astonishment for the space of one minute. Then she asked wistfully, Do you mean that I did truly bring you bad luck? You truly did, he said peevishly. I'm all broken up in my business, cleaned out, done for. Tilda Jane pushed the hair back from her forehead with a bewildered gesture. Her benefactor was in trouble, perhaps ruined, and through her. But this was no time for reflection. The urgency of the case demanded action. Mr. Hank, she said softly, weren't it a roguey kind of business anyway? 
All businesses is roguey, he said gruffly. I guess you didn't mean that, she said mildly. I know you didn't mean that I've done you harm. I guess you're just in trouble like the river in the spring when the ice goes mixy maxy every way. He smiled slightly as he rose and looked down into the shrewd little face. Well, ta-ta, Tilda, be a good girl. Where are you going? she asked helplessly. Blessed if I know, somewhere to earn a living, to Canada, maybe. Don't you go through Vanceboro, she said sharply. Then she pressed her hands to her head. I think I'm crazy. Are you Hank Dillson, standing there saying you're going to leave us like this? Don't take on, Tilda, he said consolingly. I'm really sorry. I wouldn't have come out of my way this much if I hadn't promised you. And if you hadn't been such a nice little girl, of course you haven't hurt me. I guess you've done me good, for I've a kind of disgust with my business ever since you set foot in my life. She paid no attention to the latter part of his speech. You say you've got to go, and I can't keep you, she murmured stupidly. And you don't know where you're going? I don't know, and I don't want to know. I'll loaf along till my money gives out, and then I'll go to work. Hank, do you think of Australia? No, I ain't got enough dough to get that far. Do you mean bread? No, I mean cash. Why don't you stay here? Nothing to do that I know of. This is a one-horse place. Hank, you ain't seen your father, she cried, catching at his coat sleeve as he turned toward the gate. Upon my word, I forgot the old man. I believe I'll go in for sixty seconds. You say his health's better? Yes, said Tilda Jane hurriedly. I didn't write you that he had a fit not long since, and it seemed to straighten him out. He goes to town on his crutches every day, and Gippy limps after him. Oh, Hank Dilson, Hank Dilson, I'm most loony about this business of you going away. Hank smiled wearily at her, and went slowly toward the house. How long can you stay, she asked, running after him. How long will you give us? He took out his watch and held it close to his face. I guess I'll take the eleven o'clock train. It's nine now. I thought I'd look up some of the boys. Give us all the time, she said pleadingly. Stay with your father and me. Oh, promise, will you? All right, he said obligingly. I don't care if I do. I'm beat out anyway. I have to go some place, but I'll be back soon, she called after him, and then she threw up both hands and pressed them over her ears, a favourite gesture with her when she was doing hard thinking. Mr. Waysmith or Mr. Tracy, she repeated half aloud. Mr. Waysmith or Mr. Tracy? Mr. Tracy, she said at last. He's almost likely. And whirling on her heel, she flew down the path, out the gate and into the street. Poacher, silent, graceful and swift, kept close to her. But the battered Gippy soon gave up the chase with a howl of protest and went limping home. Hank, to his surprise, had on the whole the most agreeable talk of his life with his father. The old man was altered. He had been, at the same time, the stiffest and most demonstrative of parents. The young man reflected. There really was a remarkable change for the better in him, and yet, at the end of three quarters of an hour, Hank got up to take his leave. They were nearly always absent from each other, they had got out of the way of taking an active interest in each other's concerns. There was not yet sufficiently firm footing and enough of it to bridge to the shaky background of the past, and parting would be a mutual relief. Yet the old man's eye twinkled wistfully as they followed his son to the door. Hank had told him nothing of his troubles, yet his father saw that he had lost flesh, that he had not a prosperous air and he actually guessed that all was not going well with him. He would find out from the young girl, and with a sigh he settled back in his chair. I'll try to come home soon again, father, said Hank dispiritedly, as he looked over his shoulder before closing the bedroom door, and he was just shrugging his shoulders at the promise, when something dark and panting caught at him in the unlighted kitchen and made him jump. End of chapter 23 Recording by Drew Conway, Kent
Chapter Twenty Four of Tilda Jane. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Drew Conway, Kent. Tilda Jane by Marshall Saunders. Chapter Twenty Four. A Friend in Need. It was Tilda Jane breathing like a racehorse. "'What's up with you, sissy?' he asked. She could not speak for a few seconds. Then she gasped with difficulty. "'Hank, dear old Hank, he's in there, the loveliest man. He's always ready to do a turn for anyone. Go in. Tell him your business.' "'I've said a little. Mind what he tells you, and you'll get on. He's helped lots of people. He was in the midst of a dinner party. He's so good.' He's just left it and come. Go. And she gave him a gentle push and sent him into the parlour, where he blinked his eyes alternately at the lamp on the table and at a small, dark, quiet man who sat with his hat on his knee. The small man was breathing hard, as if he too had been walking fast, but on seeing Hank he rose and stood with outstretched hand. My name is Tracy, he said kindly and I have come to this town since you left it, but I know your family. I know you too, said Hank bluntly, from her letters, and he jerked his head backward, but Tilda Jane, after softly closing the door, had disappeared. Mr. Tracy sat down again, and Hank sat opposite him. A slight and awkward pause ensued, broken speedily, however, by the minister. Young man, you are in trouble. "'Yes, I am that,' said Hank gruffly. "'State your trouble,' said the minister kindly. Hank hesitated an instant, then his word came with a rush. "'You've visited creameries, sir?' "'I have.' "'Well, there's good creameries and bad creameries. "'A few years ago, when I was casting about in my mind for something to do, "'I got in with a Chicago firm known as the White Elephant Firm, owing to so many states being spotted with their buildings loaded on the farmers and costing too much to keep up. Being a main man, they sent me to my own state. I was one of their most go-ahead sharks. Now they've fired me to fix themselves right with the farmers. Do you know how they take in a community, sir? No, I don't. Well, suppose you're a shark. You navigate round among the farmers and make a smother of big talk about hauling in buckets full of money. You get a committee to visit some creamery where the outfit is sorted to make an extra showing. You pay the farmer's expenses, you offer them a block of stock, and up goes the creamery in their district with machinery from the promoting company, costing two or three times over what everything is worth. When the whole thing's up, It'll usually dawn on the minds of your stockholders that creamery ain't much without cows, and their cows ain't got enough milk to pay for the fuel they burn. Way back here, fifty miles, I had a whipped-up creamery. I had a man run the machinery, but he was a simpleton. He ruined the separator. It had to be sent back to the shop, and I got mad with him. Then he blabbed, told everything he knew, and a lot he didn't and the farmers stopped counting their cows long enough to listen. Hasty words flew round about fraudulent subscriptions, vitiated transactions, no contracts, ruined farms, going to law, and I thought it was time to skip. The firm had made me stop there up to this, and as soon as I ran, they bounced me. I'm all played out here, sir. My native state bids me farewell. Hank suddenly ceased speaking, his head dropped on his breast, yet before it did so, he shot one appalling hopeful glance at his listener. Despite his don't-care tone and off-hand manner, it was plainly to be seen that he felt himself in trouble and knew that there was one at hand who would help him. "'You've been in a poor business,' observed Mr. Tracy quietly. "'You want to quit it?' "'Yes, sir,' said Hank meekly. Listen, then. And his companion in his turn began to speak rapidly. Tilda Jane, flying about the house, sent many an anxious thought to the closed parlour. 
What was the minister saying to Hank? Would Hank talk to him freely? Oh, Lord, 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 she cried, suddenly stopping and raising her clasped hands to the ceiling. Do make his heart soft, soft as mush, and don't let him be sassy. The minister is smooth and nice, and he would stand sass, but it's awful bad for Hank. He's got to sober down. Oh, Lord, make him solemn, just like an owl. She dashed a tear from the corner of her eye and went on with her occupation of wrapping various articles in a red handkerchief. When the parlour door opened, she ran to the front hall, and as Mr. Tracy passed her, she caught his hand and pressed it fervently. He said nothing, but smiling with the more than earthly sweetness of one who truly loved his fellow men, he hurried back to his deserted guests. Hank followed close at his heels, and as he stood in the hall doorway, looking already straighter and taller, he smiled patronisingly down at Tilda Jane. "'You're a mighty fine girl, sissy. How old are you now?' Thirteen o'clock last week. Struck fourteen this. Oh, what did the minister say?' Hank thumped his chest. "'He's got me a situation, sissy, a situation that means bread and butter for you and father.' and maybe cake and jam. The little girl locked her hands in intense excitement. Where, Hank? Oh, where? Here, sissy. In Siskaset. Yes? Tilda Jane suppressed a scream. And you can live at home? Well, I rather guess so. Tilda Jane's pleasure was too deep for words. She stood gaping speechlessly at him. Hank, in high good humour, beamed benevolently on the orphan girl as she stood beside him. "'What are you sticking your head up and down for, like a chicken taking a drink?' he said at last. "'Hank, I'm giving thanks,' she said reverently. "'Giving thanks that you've got lead out of that roguey business.' "'I'll not get into anything of that kind again, sissy,' he said, with a shamefaced air. "'You may just be sure of that.' I've had a great talk with that friend of yours, and, Sissy, I'm obliged to you. There was a queer break in his voice. An end had suddenly come to his troubles. He would now be in the way of earning an honest living, and it would be a pleasure to live with his father and this young girl, who would look up to him and admire him. Sissy, he said abruptly, where do you think my new birth is? I don't know. Oh, tell me quick. In the Waysmith lumber mill. Mr. Waysmith offered a place to your friend Tracy today for some young man, and I'm the young man. With the Waysmiths, murmured Tilda Jane, where your father used to be. The same, sissy. Tilda Jane could stand no more. Oh, Lord, I thank thee, she cried with a burst of tears, and running into the kitchen, she buried her face in the roller towel hanging on a door. Hank sauntered after her, and on his way stumbled over a bundle done up in a spotted red handkerchief. He stooped down, picked it up, and opened it. It contained a few lumps of sugar, a Bible, a pair of socks, two handkerchiefs, half a loaf of cake, and fifty cents wrapped in a piece of newspaper. My travelling kit, he murmured. Well, if she ain't the best little creature. Hello, Tilda, he cried out. Stop that whimpering and come and tell your grandpa the news. The little girl hastily dried her face on the towel and ran into the bedroom where grandpa sat surveying them in bewilderment from the edge of his bed. Some time ago he had come to his room with the intention of undressing. His son's visit upset him and he had been sitting confusedly listening to the scraps of conversation he caught from different parts of the house. Grandpa, Grandpa, cried Tilda Jane, running in and excitedly waving her hands. Hank's going to live at home with you and me and the dogs. We'll be a real family. Oh, ain't it lovely? Ain't it lovely? And catching hold of her skirts, she began a sidling, a peculiar dance about the room. Hank laughed till the tears came into his eyes. Tilda Jane was good, but she was not graceful. Then his merriment over, he began to yawn, and Tilda Jane, as keen of observation as ever, immediately espied this sign of fatigue. 
she caught up gippy who alone showed no pleasure at the prospect of having another inmate of the house and danced out to the kitchen come out grandpa dear she called we'll all have a good supper cause this is the most joyful occasion as grandpa started to limp out to the kitchen hank quietly placed himself by his side the old man looked at him i'm not sorry you're going to stay he remarked gruffly they say there's no place like home you'd better believe that's true father said hank warmly a feller gets sick of hotels and boarding houses we'll have some more funds now that i'm going to get at some decent kind of work you mustn't bother your head about expenses the old man sank into his chair with a sigh of relief his face was working strangely last year at this time he was alone and miserable in a cheerless house now his son was with him a brisk young girl was flying about his kitchen a bright fire burned in the stove a fire that was not unpleasantly warm to his aged limbs even on a summer's night a white cloth covered his formerly bare and uninvited table he was going to have pie and coffee and toast and cake for supper surely the coming of this orphan had been a fortunate thing for him and he slowly chaffed his hands as he gazed at the glowing beds of coals hank was following tilda jane from kitchen to pantry and from pantry to kitchen you're getting to be a great housekeeper he said admiringly but we must not forget the schooling it's a great thing to be educated you can't hold your own in this world unless you know something you wrote me mrs tracy was teaching you some didn't you tilda jane paused as she filled a sugar bowl yes three evenings a week she's a boss i mean she's a good teacher and i learned some at the asylum no the asylum when i weren't no when i weren't no when i wasn't in the kitchen and grandpa talks to me some he's a fine scholar that's good get all you can but three evenings a week ain't enough as soon as i can compass it i'll have someone to take care of father daytimes and let you go to school to school said the little girl to learn more to know how to speak proper oh oh i'm most too happy to live hank dilson i think you're the most beautiful man that was ever made and dropping her sugar bowl on the shelf she seized a hand of the ex creamery shark and warmly pressed it between her little lean palms hank in some embarrassment murmured oh fudge i'm not as good as the next one you're a million times better exclaimed tilda jane oh what a glad man mr waysmith will be to have you in his mill come now let's have supper dear old grandpa must get to bed you wouldn't like to kill him with joy the first night you're home a few minutes later tilda jane was beaming behind the big coffee pot at last she had become a member of a really happy family her dogs were stretched luxuriously on their rag mat by the stove grandpa calm and quiet was sipping his coffee and listening to some of hank's travelling adventures she could not contain her delight her heart was too full and presently she burst into low irrepressible laughter her companion stopped talking and stared at her oh i can't help it she exclaimed wildly i feel as if i've come through a big sea of troubles to reach the promised land i'm crazy i'm crazy and too excited to keep still she pushed her chair aside and rocked back and forth on her feet she saw stretching before her a long vista of happy years the sight was almost too much for her yet even in her ecstasy she thought of other children less fortunate hank brother hank she called suddenly the trace is said to pass on blessings all the world ain't joyful like us when you make a little money will you let me write to the lady boards for another orphan the ugliest little orphan they've got worse than me if it's not impossible you just write it down that i will said hank gazing kindly and benevolently at her flushed face we'll do it cried tilda jane we'll be good to the other orphan i know they'll have one but how can i wait what shall i do i must hug someone i'm so happy she flashed a glance at the dogs they were sleepy and comfortable grandpa i guess it'll have to be you 
she said gaily, and running to the old man, she threw her arms around his wrinkled neck, kissed his bald head, and fulfilled her promise of hugging so vigorously that at last he called for mercy. Now I'll go take something, she said demurely, and with a last caress, you darling old grandpa, I could eat you, Lord. Give me a thankful heart for all these mercies. Then reverently, bending her head over her plate, she took up her knife and fork with a long and happy sigh. The End End of chapter 24 Recording by Drew Conway Kent End of Tilda Jane by Marshall Saunders